Travel Television is honored to have Senator Harris Wofford, who has a long history in the civil rights and service movements. During the Kennedy era, Senator Wofford worked with Sergeant Shriver to create the Peace Corps, and 50 years later, he continues to be a leader for community and national service. Thank you, Senator Wofford, for joining us today. Can you share a story from your time with the President? Sergeant Shriver was the civil rights man of the campaign, and I was his deputy, and out of the blue, a, a member of our civil rights section called to say, my daughter's at the University of Michigan, and the last night after midnight, going on till one and two o'clock, waiting for Kennedy, he came and gave a talk that suggested that he might want to ask young people to go overseas and serve America in different ways there. And he pushed the question, would you go? And it was when the Kennedy car heard the story that, that a thousand students were saying yes uh, to this extemporaneous question he put, that he turned to Ted Sorensen, the great major speechwriter for him, and said, let's make a, this is hot, let's make a, a, a big proposal for it. The speech got drafted and delivered to the Cow Palace in San Francisco to 10,000 or so people. We cannot discontinue training our young men as soldiers of war, but we also want them to be ambassadors of peace. In one sense, uh, Sergeant Shriver and I both said, this is really going to work, isn't it? But we had nothing to do with it until uh, after the election, Kennedy, at the inaugural parade, said, you know this idea of a Peace Corps that I proposed out in Michigan? You're the person to Sergeant Shriver. You know, Sarge, you're the one to propose and build this Peace Corps. And by then I had such a faith in Shriver. So there'd be two ways when I uh, uh, thought it was going to be a, a real part of American life. I went off to Africa by the request of the president to be the Peace Corps representative in Africa. I was working in the White House on civil rights with him. And he and I agreed that I would go to Ethiopia where the emperor had said, we want 500 Peace Corps teachers, which we produced in due course. And a great new university had been built, a lot of American money going into it but they didn't have enough coming out of schools that were ready to go to college. And so they urgently needed teachers. Did you have a particular inspiration or vision when you started out? What got me onto this whole concept of, of uh, full-time national service was being on a ship. There were these young men who just started singing and I cornered one of them. And I said, you know, what are you all up to, about 15 or 20? They said, we're Mormons. If you're a Mormon man, it's not a question of do you do service, but where, at home or abroad? And I remember turning to the woman in due course married me, and I said, you know, that's what we should do for all Americans, not just one group of people doing it. And I st still believe that, but it was an accident that those singers sang. And um, so no telling what accidents uh, you and I uh, can uh, still have. So in 2016, we celebrate the launch of the Service Year Alliance. So please tell us about this new initiative and how people can be a part of it. General McChrystal came home from uh, the Middle Eastern Wars and turned his thoughts on uh, the state of citizenship and patriotism of America at home uh, out at a we Aspen Institute Colorado conference on what we should do better in this country. Uh, General McChrystal got up and said, uh, I think that we should have full-time service, service years, the way we have military service years. It's so easy for me to imagine, for example, that, that most colleges and universities would adopt this. 
That's why volunteering in America is at the highest level it's been in years. And I know that makes uh, Harris proud to hear. Now, Harris Walker has devo devoted his entire life to creating opportunities for Americans to serve. Uh, and the reason it's such a privilege for me to share uh, the stage with him uh, is because you've taken commitment to a whole new life. Harris Wofford has spent more than 50 years empowering ordinary citizens to make extraordinary change. A friend to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and an advisor to President John F. Kennedy, Harris fought alongside civil rights leaders to end segregation and advance the march of justice. During his time at the White House with the Peace Corps as a senator and leading the Corporation for National and Community Service, he gave generations of Americans the chance to serve their country. The United States honors Harris Wofford for upholding national service as one of our nation's highest causes. So I, I hope that uh, what a lot of people out of the experience will take the ball and run with that. I can't run anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to admit it, age 90, uh, it's not a running time, but uh, for, for, for what I can do, the ball I would be trying to carry right now would be the service year. All right, thank you so much, Senator Wofford. We really appreciate you being here. For Travel Television, I'm Carrie Keenan. Have you wondered how you fulfill your life through service to others? Each month, a Travel Television team of volunteers presents volunteering during natural disasters and people who build a better world through service projects. Helping strangers, restoring communities, helping the helpless. Could you tell us a story about Harris Wolford? Harris Wofford is one of the great leaders of our country. He worked with Mahat Gandhi, he worked with Martin Luther King, he worked with President Kennedy. Uh, the scope of what he has experienced and what he's done is really unbelievable. He was one of my dad's best friends, and he was instrumental in the creation of the Peace Corps. Uh, my father ran the Civil Rights uh, Division on uh, Senator Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1960, and Harris and a guy named Louis Martin were his right and left hands. Uh, and they really worked and pushed the Kennedy campaign uh, to reach out to Martin Luther King's family after uh, Dr. King was arrested a couple of weeks before the election. It's a famous saying that the Kennedy campaign was told that if Senator Kennedy said anything positive about Khrushchev, Castro, or King, the Southern governors would throw their support to Richard Nixon. So King was really that hated in this country and that radical a figure in 1960. And when he was elected, uh, Harris and Dad went to Senator Kennedy and proposed that Senator Kennedy call Coretta Scott King and express their, their Senator Kennedy's concern about Martin Luther King's uh, health. And uh, originally they were told no, but they waited, Dad waited, popped the question to Uncle Jack when no one was around. Senator Kennedy made the call. That Civil Rights Division was closed down because there was a lot of flack. But a couple of days later it became clear when Daddy King, who had already endorsed Richard Nixon, uh, came out in support of Senator Kennedy. Daddy King was a Republican and a Protestant, and at that time, Senator Kennedy, a Democrat and a Catholic, was a huge deal. No Catholic has ever been elected president other than Senator Kennedy. Um, and Daddy King changed his vote. And if you look at the votes of African Americans, they went up in such a degree that most people think that that's what got Kennedy elected. And it's because of that idea that Harris had, Harris Wofford had, talked to my father about it. My father executed it with Senator Kennedy. And that changed, I think, the course of history in not only 1960, and, uh, but I think also helped to one small step to try to heal racial issues in this country a hundred years from the Civil War, you know, in 1960. And I think that made a big difference. He's a great guy and a great leader on so many fronts, particularly on the service front. He's so instrumental on the creation of AmeriCorps under President Clinton uh, and, and keeping that alive and moving. He's just a wonderful leader. So you helped create the Peace Corps. When did you know this would become part of the national fabric of the U.S. and of the world? Well, first I should tell you that 
uh, Sergeant Shriver, who is the builder of the Peace Corps when he was appointed by President Kennedy to create it, um, was the, the civil rights man of the campaign, and I was his deputy. And out of the blue, a, a member of our civil rights section called to say, uh, my daughter's at the University of Michigan, and the, last night uh, uh, after uh, midnight, uh, going on till, toward one and two o'clock, waiting for Kennedy, he came and gave a talk that suggested that he might want to ask young people to go overseas and serve America in different ways there. And he, he pushed the question, would you go? And he got a lot of applause. And the next morning, uh, it turned out that we were told by the mother of one of those students that nearly a thousand students on their own initiative had taken a s scroll around saying, uh, if you propose a, a service program overseas, we will go, yes. And uh, we arranged for them to present the idea to Kennedy, but it was when the Kennedy ca car uh, heard the story that, that a thousand students were saying yes uh, to this extemporaneous question he put that he turned to Ted Sorensen, the great major speechwriter for him, and said, let's make, a, this is hot, let's make a, a, a big proposal for it. And uh, before I really knew what was happening, or Schreiber knew, uh, the speech got drafted and delivered to the Cow Palace in San Francisco to 10,000 or so people. And uh, in one sense, uh, Sergeant Shriver and I both said, this is really going to work, isn't it? But we had nothing to do with it until uh, after the election, uh, Kennedy uh, at the inaugural parade said, you know this idea of a Peace Corps that I support, that proposed out in Michigan, uh, you're the person to Sergeant Shriver. But it was a great adventure to uh, to suge it suggested to me then and now that we should define in our, in our education program for all young Americans, um, and, and this goes all to youngish 90-year-olds uh, like, like myself. I mean, it isn't only limited to the secondary school or even college but that, that part of the definition of a good education should be that there'd be a very big uh, slice. Uh, service year is now the current slogan of, of the movement that I'm working with on this right now. Um, but how do you, the challenge as the Peace Corps grew, it was 16,000 when founder Sergeant Shriver and I left the same year uh, to go into education myself for a while. And um, 16,000 a year, it was to be 25,000 the next year in terms of Amer uh, going to other places. But f uh, service is not just going overseas, it's in our own country and in our areas that most needed help, uh, especially uh, poverty and, and education uh, go together and uh, the challenge of America is still very, very large there. And full-time service, not just on the Peace Corps for two years overseas, but for a year or two uh, in this country as part of higher education in this country uh, seems to me the way to go. We're not there yet by far have a favorite project that you were involved with, with on the domestic side? Um, I was part of a, a very lively organization today called Youth Service America uh, that in, involves uh, service days in honor of Martin Luther King and various other things I'm, I'm on the board of. But uh, Youth Service America in the 19... 
1957, um, called a conference at Brown University to see how to organize large-scale national service. And two young guys came up, a number of people proposed different ways, Alan Casey and Michael Brown. And they outlined how they wanted, they were going to start a city year. In fact, they were already raising money on their own without, it, without any government support to start in Boston. And it, it's, been, it's been a, a, a great program. Uh, I can't say now how many scores of uh, cities now have a city year, but I think you'd say second only to, in numbers, uh, less than uh, Teach for America. Has volunteering changed in the past 50 years? One of the ways I think it's changed, uh, not enough uh, from my point of view, is that volunteering or volunteerism, um, which in general means to people doing good on Sunday or doing good once a week or part-time service uh, on a huge scale if you include service through the religious organizations. But volunteerism um, is, is good, uh, but it, it needs the, the, uh, ye the, the, the yeast of, of full-time service. And uh, that's increasingly through AmeriCorps and, and the Peace Corps uh, and hundreds of organizations that got created with inventive ideas on how to deal with problems in that community. Um, we, we, we need to add that dimension to volunteering. And uh, Shriver uh, was very bold in calling the Peace Corps members Peace Corps volunteers. And some of the nonprofits who were doing volunteering or believed in volunteerism felt that by definition this was doing something without pay. Well, you don't have an army living on no pay and you don't have an army of uh, non-military service. General McChrystal um, came home from uh, the Middle Eastern wars and turned his thoughts on uh, the state of, of, um, of, of citizenship and patriotism uh, of, of America at home. And the, uh, out at a we Aspen Institute Colorado uh, conference on th what we should do better in this country, uh, General McChrystal got up and said, uh, I think that we should have full-time service, service years, the way we have military service years, and that it should be the same roughly numbers who are in full-time military service uh, and the non-military service should be of the same size and he is uh, devoting his life right now to, to moving uh, what, what's called the Service Year Alliance. Uh, not just one organization organizing it at all, the opposite of that. Uh, for uh, the, th the thesis of that movement is to get uh, nonprofit organizations, religious organizations, uh, corporations, uh, very importantly, colleges and universities to create their own programs for service years. And whether they get some or no money from the federal government to find the way to fund that. So there's several programs for baby boomers as well. So what are your thoughts on the thousands that join that group each year? Well, I, I hope that uh, every, all, in a sense all, all of this that I'm talking about is not just limited to young people. Uh, uh, I've, I've been part of a, a venture called the Experience Wave to try to uh, persuade governors and legislators and 
and, and civic groups and others to multiply the number of opportunities, making use of the talent that the, the baby boomers now that they're, they're, they're uh, booming maybe, but not babies anymore. The Peace Corps, for example, uh, itself, it, it, it relishes uh, getting uh, old, older people with uh, real skills. And uh, uh, I think that that ought to be high on the agenda of, of um, the American people on how those opportunities, uh, the, the hard working years in, in your career are the less, uh, are the ones that are, the periods that are least, uh, people are free to do what a student out of high school or out of college or halfway through college or in the first decade can do before they settle on which their career is. And maybe they find the career in part by volunteer service. But I was saying that a lot of the volunteer ser work, nonprofits, uh, were very irritated with Shriver calling them Peace Corps volunteers because volunteering means free. And of course, General McChrystal and the military says that's not what the volunteer army, which we adopted, uh, have. They get have to get supported. Did you have a particular inspiration or vision when you started out? Well, I, I hope people have luck. You know, I, there's this great line that Alexander Hamilton has is the first proposition of the first Federalist paper to persuade people to, of, the, of the American Revolution to form a, un, a union and the government, a single government. And he said, it seems to have been left to the American people to decide the important question of whether uh, it is really possible or not to, for a society to be organized uh, by and run by, by reflection and choice, or we are always destined to be deter our fate to be determined by accident and force. The Congress, for example, um, and and uh, this is just taking off in terms of a of a new form uh, fo focused on the idea of the service year. It's a simple idea, full time service year, and d defined often by an academic full time year. And uh, I, it's so easy for me to imagine. For example, that that most colleges and universities would adopt this in different sizes and scales, uh, and with different focuses and and different ways of doing it, and and uh, it, that corporations and and alumni, for example, would like to support uh, their college that they went to. We have many mayors that do each year uh, a recognition of AmeriCorps in the ranks of uh, uh, hundreds, hundreds of mayors, make it a day of recognition. And I hope that that grows into a commitment to actually say, how do we do this in our community? How do we uh, say that every young person in the school system here will have this opportunity and uh, not just depend on what the Congress can do to help or the president can do to help. But the other side of this is, I think a president who really uh, puts priority on moving this issue, whether it's with money from the, the government of the United States or if it's in terms of the persuasion of uh, different institutions in America to, to, to pick up the ball on this. It's, it's vital if this is to really move that it be nonpartisan. Um, and it, it, it was in its beginning uh, very nonpartisan. Uh, it, it, uh, it came to another high point 
when the Serve America Act uh, was uh, adopted by Congress. It was Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy, a, a leading Republican and a leading Democrat, who took the lead on this. Uh, and it called for a major expansion of national service. And the President, uh, Obama, asked for a health care bill and, and the uh, Serve America Act in the first 100 days. And if you want full-time service, unless you leave it to those who are really wealthy, it has to be supported in one way or the other. And I, I relish the time in which it's uh, predominantly uh, supported by the, the civic center section the, uh, and not depend just on government. Mm -hmm. What do you predict for the next decade as far as service goes in the U.S.? I th I'm, I'm not necessarily optimistic, and uh, I, um, um, I hope uh, that there are um, more Republicans like Senator McCain, who are strong supporters of uh, national service, and that it not because it began with Kennedy and was uh, AmeriCorps was with, uh, uh, with the, the Clintons, uh, one of whom is running for president. Um, it's it's a very it's 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 a difficult time. Uh, I think it, it would be easy for people to say this, you know, that's that's not the way the world's going right now in this country, and that would there be some evidence that that we're holding on, but we're not expanding in this uh, creative d dimension of the service year. But I, uh, I hope in the, uh, the years I have ahead, I'm going to see that, that come. I'm going to see a president who uh, gives great priority. Uh, Obama did what he could in his first uh, in his first message to Congress, he asked for two things in the first hundred year, days, days, Roosevelt's hundred days. And one was a health care plan for all, and the other was the American Serve, Serve America Act. All right. Thank you so much, Senator Wofford. We really appreciate you being here. For Travel Television, I'm Carrie Keenan.